And I am now very pleased to introduce Dr. Shafali Sperling Jesty, um, who is giving our next talk here. Dr. Jesty joined us a few years ago. She came out of Harvard. Um, she's a pediatric neurologist, an expert in um, uh, very working with toddlers and very young children in, with developmental delays, particularly autism, tuberous sclerosis, and other disorders like that. And she's also an expert in uh, EEG. And today she will be talking to you about um, the A to Z's, which I assume <laughs> means sleep, of neurological comorbidities in autism spectrum disorders from workup to management. Thank you, Shafali. Hi, everyone. Okay, thanks for having me. Um, I'm not, I probably won't finish early, but I'll try to leave a few minutes for questions. But I'm also moderating the, the session at the end. Um, where we'll take your questions, both clinical and research-related questions. I'll also put up a slide at the end that highlights all the studies that we do at CART um, and contact information in case any of you are interested in participating or I'm um, just finding out more about the research. So I come today actually wearing the hat of a pediatric neurologist, um, not the hat of the director of the neurophysiology core in our center. And I'm going to talk to you about some of the neurological comorbidities that we see in autism, because I think they're not only very prevalent, as I'll emphasize, but also really critical for our understanding of possibly meaningful clinical subgroups that may respond better to certain interventions. And yes, that was very good, Susan. That was the A's to Z's, because I will be talking about sleep. Uh, my quick disclosure is that I do consult for Roche. So I am going to talk with you about three major comorbidities, focusing mostly on epilepsy and sleep impairment, because we actually have some clinical treatments for those two. Um, but I'll also end with some discussion about the motor impairments we see in autism. Um, throughout, I'll highlight some sort of seminal critical papers that I think are useful for you to know about. I'm happy to give people a PDF of these slides afterwards. The slides that you have in your um, handouts or online are similar, but not exactly the same. Hence, I'm happy to not hear crinkling papers through the talk because I did make some changes to make it more updated. I've also happened to actually, writ I've written several reviews on the neurology of autism over the last few years. And I'll highlight some of those papers as well because those do uh, provide some of the more up-to-date information about these three areas. Um, this is a review that um, I wrote in Current Opinion in Neurology a couple of years ago that highlights these issues. So as Ted you know, gave you a really nice background on autism, autism is a diagnosis based on the um, presence of two major areas of impairment, you know, social communication function, and then the presence of repetitive behaviors and restricted interests. As many of you probably know in this room, there's many comorbidities that are associated with ASD. And often when you go to a talk on comorbidities, you'll see sort of a, this Venn diagram and then sort of the comorbidities out in the periphery. I would argue that actually the neurological comorbidities that we see are really integrated and integral to the core deficits. They affect social communication function, they affect the presence of repetitive behaviors and restricted interests, and vice versa. It might be that actually some of the core deficits actually impact um, the development and the, uh, the outcome of some of these comorbidities. I also kind of intentionally put the three of these in a Venn diagram that overlap because we find that these three comorbidities absolutely overlap. And that, for instance, epilepsy and sleep impairment are often found together in patients with autism. And finally, um, another overlapping um, orb here is intellectual disability. And I place that very carefully overlapping, but not completely overlapping, because of the fact that intellectual disability and cognitive impairment is very common in children who have autism and neurological comorbidities. Now, this is of clinical importance and interest as we think about screening and treatment and trying to improve overall cognitive outcomes, but it's also important when we think about mechanisms of disease, and I'll get to that at the very end, as I like to call, and I sort of stole this coin term from Dan in a new review he wrote, the new neurology of autism, which really really is informed by mechanisms and pathways that are largely informed by genetics. So, you know, I've already sort of said some of this, but our key themes here is that intellectual disability is common in these comorbidities, but is not overlapping 100%, but they're not part, and while they're not part of the core deficits, they're very important for overall functioning. And that in that setting, screening and treatment for these comorbidities is critical. So I'm gonna give you kind of the sort of clinical view of each of these comorbidities, and then we'll talk about what we know about treatment and mechanism. 
So we'll start from the beginning. For those of you who are clinicians in the room, some of the terms I described might be overview um, or um, review, and I apologize, but for some of the parents hopefully in the room, these might be terms that you hear floating around and no one's ever actually defined them for you. So hopefully it'll be helpful for some of you in the room. So what is epilepsy? Epilepsy does not actually relate to cause. Epilepsy is simply the presence of more than one seizure in a lifetime that's unprovoked, right? So if you have two seizures that are unprovoked, that is epilepsy. Uh, we diagnose seizures and epilepsy by uh, the clinical events that a child has, as well as by the electroencephalogram or the EEG, which is essentially a recording of the brain's waves, right? So the brain is made up of millions and billions of neurons um, that communicate and fire, and when those neurons communicate, they generate electrical signals that we can actually record at the scalp. So when thousands of those neurons get together and communicate and generate those tiny signals, um, we can actually record that at the scalp, and that is what the EEG is picking up. Now, to have a clinical diagnosis of a seizure, you don't have to have the EEG or the clinical event, but the way that as neurologists we are most comfortable with making a diagnosis of a seizure is that we see a clinical event and there's an EEG pattern that relates to that event, meaning the EEG is abnormal in a way that, that convinces us that this was probably a seizure. And you can see one example down there of an EEG. Those are the electrodes uh, that are around the scalp. And you see kind of normal brain activity. And then you see in the middle that pattern of what we call kind of diffuse spike in wave activity. That's actually the EEG of someone who had a staring spell. And while the staring spell was happening, this EEG was recorded and that event was a seizure. So that's how we, that's sort of our gold standard way of diagnosing seizures. We don't always have the luxury of all those tools, and I'll get into that in a minute. Um, with the EEG, though, we can break down the EEG into different oscillations or brain wave frequencies, and those different oscillatory patterns actually help us to think about, you know, what do we expect to see in typical development in terms of oscillation patterns? And then when we see things that are a little bit different, like at that bottom, See if I can actually use my cursor. Yeah, so right here, you see these waves that are a lot slower. These are waves we typically see in sleep. So if we see that in a child who's awake, we might think those aren't quite normal brain waves. Now, do those waves mean that child's having seizures? That's another question. I'll get to that in a minute. But we really quantify these different brain waves when we do a clinical EEG and when we do some of our research EEGs. So I'm going to give you some kind of basic pearls or facts about epilepsy that I think are important because they're questions that are raised for me in clinic quite a bit. First is that seizures come in lots of different forms, but we generally characterize them as generalized or partial, and that's actually based on where in the brain they come from. So a generalized seizure usually, hap it, it usually starts all over the brain, but if it doesn't, it en ends up in the whole brain. So when you do an EEG while a child's having a generalized seizure, you will see abnormal activity on all the electrodes of the brain. So it's a diffuse process. So as you may imagine, a child with a generalized seizure will have an alteration in mental status. Right? They might lose consciousness or just might seem very confused. Whereas a partial seizure is one that starts and stays in one part of the brain. So a child may just have a motor mannerism or a, um, you know, a, a, an involuntary motor movement, which could be a partial seizure. The other big sort of pearl that I have to put out here is that not all staring spells are seizures. So one of the most common referrals that we as neurologists get uh, from the community is that a child's having staring spells. Now, as I mentioned with the EG, it is hard, and we don't always know if a staring spell is a seizure or not. But there are certain epilepsies that are associated with staring spells, absent seizures being the most common type. And in those seizures, in absence epilepsy, there's a very classic EEG pattern that is associated with that staring spell. And so if there's concern about staring spells, we certainly will evaluate with an EEG. And then I'll, I'll, the last sort of pearl I would bring up here before we get into kind of the autism epilepsy association is that sometimes regression can be due to epilepsy. And I emphasize sometimes because it is only sometimes. Now, the classic sort of epilepsy regression that's been described in the literature and that we've known about clinically for many, many years is a very profound regression. This is not a slight dip in development. The epilepsy regression we usually see is a child who has full use of language, phrased speech, and then over a quite quick time course, like weeks, stops talking completely, right? So that's a profound language regression, and there's, there's, a, there's this couple of syndromes associated with that sort of a regression. Having said that, if there's a profound change in a child's developmental trajectory, we as neurologists do take that seriously, and we will evaluate for possible seizures. 
Okay, so let's talk about the epidemiology of epilepsy and autism so that I stay on track with time. Um, so epilepsy's been known since the first cases of autism. Abnormal EEGs, and now I told you about how we kind of quantify different waves in EEGs, have been reported actually in up to half of children with autism. However, the prevalence of epilepsy, actual seizures happening at least once in autism, is a, that prevalence is about 20%. The prevalence of autism symptoms in a population of children with epilepsy has also been studied, and that rate is about 5%, although the rates in both of these studies vary quite a bit. And it depends on the type of population you're studying, which I'll get to in a minute. But if you read several papers on the prevalence of epilepsy and autism, you'll see rates ranging from 5 to 46%, again, based on the type of population study. Importantly, and somewhat Frustratingly, there isn't a primary seizure type that's identified. It's not that the autism epilepsy looks a certain way. That would help us a lot, actually, in terms of treatment, but there isn't one, uh, one cause, or one type, I should say. Um, you know, when, before I talk about a couple of important papers, I'll say that, you know, the, that, that very high association of epilepsy with autism of at least 20%, you know, begs the question, well, what's going on here? And there's two very simple kind of schemes that I like to think about. And it's really, is there a cause or effect? And this is a fig figure from a paper that Dan Geshwin and I wrote uh, a couple of years ago on, uh, on the uh, uh, genetics of autism. And, and, you know, there's two possibilities here, right? One is that there's a common genetic or biological mechanism that is causing aberrant brain development, right? It's causing an imbalance of excitation inhibition, possibly causing migrational abnormalities in the brain. And then that actual baseline etiology is causing both epilepsy and autism, right? The other possibility is actually that there is still an underlying cause, likely genetic or um, otherwise, and that that actually causes early, uh, uh, early hyperexcitability in the brain that causes seizures, which then predisposes the child to further delays in development. Now, you might ask, well, that's great theorizing. How do you answer that question? Well, the perfect studies to do this would actually be following infants longitudinally, right? From the time that we know that the brain might be going awry a bit, right? To really study what comes first, epilepsy or autism, and how they interplayed? Well, that's challenging because we don't have that many opportunities to study these high-risk infants from birth. We do have our infant sibling study, which in which we can actually examine some of these questions. Um, we've been actually, and I won't go into this in too much detail, we've been studying one population here at UCLA and at Boston Children's of a group of children with tuberous sclerosis complex. That is the genetic syndrome at very, where these children are very high risk for autism and epilepsy. And they're diagnosed in utero often, so we can follow them from birth. And this is just one figure from a paper that we published last year in neurology, where basically we found that infants with TSE who went on to have autism showed a, a, a significant decline in their nonverbal cognitive skills between 12 and 36 months, right? They were significantly different from their non-ASD cohort at 36, but the slope was different um, from 12 to 36 months. But what was really striking to us here is that only in the ASD group was there a significant association between seizure severity and the slope which means that the children who went, to, went on to have autism were actually more vulnerable to their epilepsy. So it suggested that there is this dynamic interplay between epilepsy and development that's going on in these high-risk syndromes. And further disentangling that is key as we think about treating some of these syndromes. So some clinical considerations in epilepsy and autism, there's a clear link to intellectual disability, and I'll show you two papers that highlight that. Uh, epilepsy and autism is twice as common in children who also have intellectual disability. It's also more common in girls. So girls with autism and intellectual disability are at the highest risk for epilepsy. And overall, the risk of epilepsy increases with age. It used to be thought that there were kind of two peaks, but we're actually finding that the peak is really in adolescence, and that's when children are at highest risk. So I'll highlight two papers quickly that I think were really seminal studies and meta-analyses in this area. This was a meta-analysis done and uh, published in Biological Psychiatry in 2008, uh, which basically uh, examined about 35 papers on autism and epilepsy. And the bottom line is the authors found that the prevalence of epilepsy in autism was 46% in those individuals who had an IQ less than 40, right? And that prevalence went down as IQ went up. This, and, and if you broke this down by gender, girls were more likely to have epilepsy than boys. This study by the city and colleagues that was published in 2013 was actually the largest study of autism and epilepsy. And what they did was they pulled from several very large national cohorts, like the Simon Simplex cohort, the GREE sample, the Autism Consortium sample. 
and they basically examined <laughs> rates of epilepsy, and they also compared clinical characteristics in children with epilepsy and children without epilepsy. And what they found was that the average prevalence across all ages was 12% but that the prevalence was 26% in children greater than age 13. They also found, as I've already sort of now hammered home, um, that epilepsy was associated with lower IQ, uh, poor adaptive and language function, um, there were cases of developmental regression with epilepsy, and more severe autism symptoms. So epilepsy is, while maybe not causative of the more severe phenotype, absolutely associated with it, and therefore it's a comorbidity that we need to take quite seriously. And I'll just mention this last paper by Patrick Bolton and colleagues, which studied a cohort of individuals with ASD into adulthood. And I only highlight here that they actually found that uh, the majority of, particip of, of individuals in the study were well controlled with one or two antiepileptics. So these are epilepsies that are manageable, right? These are not all intractable epilepsies. And they also found that epilepsy was associated with uh, female gender, intellectual disability, and language impairment. So that's epilepsy. What about just the EEG? I mentioned that 50% of children with, with autism have abnormalities on their EEG. Now, I say that in quotes. I do use the quotes, actually, more than Ted does, probably. But um, those abnormalities are just differences based on what we expect to see in typical development, right? So we might see more slowing. We might see a spike here and there. It's not related or diagnostic of epilepsy. These kids aren't having seizures, but we see these baseline abnormalities. And in the, in the slides that you guys got, I actually had a table that goes through some of the studies that have, that have examined isolated EEG abnormalities, if you want those references. But the rates are variable, again, up to 60%. And you, you could guess now, well, which studies would have rates of 60%? Well, it's the populations where children are more disabled. There's a higher rate of intellectual disability, girls. And we also find this in kids who are referred because there's a concern about seizures, right? So if you have a selection bias there because children are coming to a neurologist, the likelihood of having some abnormality on EEG will be higher. But this actually gives us a really interesting window into research. And this is actually something that Dr. Hopman mentioned earlier. So we know that EEG abnormalities alone don't cause autism and we don't treat EEG abnormalities. But what is the EEG? I already sort of mentioned, and this is a talk unto itself, I'll just say it in a snippet, but EEG is a beautiful measure of real-time brain activity and real-time network connections, right? And we know that autism in part is a disorder of early developmental brain connections, if you will. And so EEG might be a very promising and time-sensitive tool to examine differences in brain connectivity. Right, examine differences in functional patterns from early in development because we know what the EEG should look like in infants and young children. And that's actually been the inspiration for a lot of the research that we do here at UCLA in early electrophysiological markers of disease as well as around the country. Um, and in our lab, we study dozens and hundreds and hundreds of infants who all are this happy when they run the EEG cap, <laughs> as my team here in the back can tell you. Um, and we capture data on their electrophysiological patterns to understand whether EEG might provide us a tool to better clinically stratify children and better identify subgroups that would help inform more meaningful mechanism-based treatments. And again, that will be a talk maybe I'll give next year for you guys. So um, what is the recommended workup for autism and epilepsy? Because I still have to get to sleep if you, everyone's still awake. Uh, so, um, so the American Academy of Neurology and the American Academy of Pediatrics came out with guidelines actually in 2000, and they haven't really been revised since then. And this is important for the clinicians in the room, those who are referring children for possible EGs. Um, EEGs are not routinely recommended for every child with autism. Okay, that's, that's a key point here. However, um, they are recommended, and I say, and they wrote a prolonged sleep deprived EEG. We actually are now recommending a 24 hour EEG just to capture sleep, to try to capture the episodes. If you're in LA, UCLA does an, an unbelievable job um, obtaining nice 24 hour data on children who can be quite challenging. Um, we do recommend obtaining an EEG if there's evidence of clinical seizures, that's sort of an obvious one. If there's a history of clear developmental regression, particularly in young children, um, or if there are situations where there's a high index of suspicion for epilepsy, such as an underlying genetic syndrome that's associated with epilepsy. And we'll get to that in a minute. So EEGs can be indicated, but not for, not for routine screening of all children with autism. So my treatment slide is only one because actually there isn't a lot of data to support speci specific treatments for autism and epilepsy in the sense that in children with epilepsy and autism, we use the medications we do 
for epilepsy as a whole. I will say, and I highlight this one medication here, which is Keppra or Levotracetam, because it, it actually is one of our first line agents in pediatric epilepsy because it's very well tolerated in general and it's not hepatically metabolized, so it doesn't need uh, constant monitoring. The problem is that in children with developmental disabilities and children with autism, Keppra can cause some significant uh, behavioral side effects. I mean, children be can become horribly dysregulated. I mean, literally climbing on furniture, on ceilings in my office, um, type, of, type of dysregulated. And so it can be a deal breaker, even though it's a really nice medication in the community. So I just bring that up for the clinicians in the room. But there is no medication that is really targeting autism and epilepsy. We just treat it for the epilepsy itself. And you know, I'll just quickly highlight that there was actually a workshop sponsored by the NIH a couple of years ago that really um, taught, had a group of experts on epilepsy talking about the comorbidity of epilepsy and autism. And I'll highlight actually this down here, which is one of the big long-term goals is to identify more novel drug targets that are based in mechanism that might help prevent epilepsy and possibly attenuate some of the autism symptoms in these children who have both comorbid comorbidities. So more to come on that. Okay, I'm doing okay. So now let's talk about sleep impairment, okay? And this is like the whirlwind tour of, of neurology. Um, I'm happy to answer questions later on, but I thought I'd give you as much information as possible in this short amount of time. So sleep, right? So this is like, of course, all of our ever elusive, elusive dream of having eight hours of amazing sleep. But uh, so just pretend that, that, you know, we'll all wish that was us. But how do we define sleep? Sleep is very important for all of us in our day-to-day -day functioning and well-being, as we all know. Uh, but we define sleep based on these cycles. And I'm giving you kind of a one-slide primer because I'm going to talk to you about the data we know on sleep impairment in autism. So we talk about sleep as going through these cycles of stage one, two, three, and four, and then REM sleep, which is rapid alternating, uh, rapid eye movements, which is the, the last stage of sleep where you actually have quite a bit of eye movements, increase in heart rate. It's actually also when you, quote, dream. So if you wake up during REM sleep, that's when you remember your dreams. Uh, these cycles are actually largely defined by the EEG, right? So you go into different stages of sleep based on the percent of your EEG or your brain waves that are slow, okay? And so a typical person cycles through these stages of sleep every couple of hours, okay? Now you notice in those couple of hours, you're not actually ever going back into wake. Right? You're just cycling through and then eventually you wake up. And that's important because these sleep cycles and our understanding of what a normal sleep cycle is helps us understand what patterns might be um, atypical in children with autism. And I see some smiles in the room. You're probably already thinking, oh, wow, like my child does not do this, right? does not sleep all eight hours. And, and that is true because it's a huge problem. So how do we diagnose sleep impairment? And then we'll get into what we know about sleep and autism. Well, the gold standard is this very fun test here, which you know kids love to do, which is the polysomnogram. And that's the gold standard because we're actually monitoring electroencephalographic and, you know, data, so the EEG brain waves, because that helps us know about the stages. We're also monitoring EEG, uh, sorry, eye movements, heart rate, blood pressure, respirations, movements. We are getting all the possible data in the world, right? And that is really the gold standard. That's the sleep study. Now, as you can imagine, not so easy to do. There are some PSG studies that have been done, um, meaning you know, large cohort studies in autism, um, but we need other tools, right? One other one tool that actually has gained a lot of traction lately is actigraphy, which and that's an example of an actigraph watch. The actigraphy basically monitors, monitors movements and can also give a good proxy for kind of circadian rhythms, sleep-wake cycles. So that's actually been a tool that people have been using more and more because you can put a watch on a child even though the watch costs you know, $3,000, but you can put a watch on a child and take it home and, and get some basic data on, on sleep-wake cycles, okay? The other way that we can really measure sleep, and some of you may have filled some of these out, are behavioral questionnaires. And this is just for your reference. These are, this slide is in your handouts. Um, I'll just highlight the fact that there's many sleep questionnaires that are out there, and they're mostly parent questionnaires. Parents are actually very good historians of sleep impairment. And what's been found, actually, is that the sleep questionnaires are quite consistent with the data that we find in the PSG studies. Okay, this first one, the Children's Sleep Habits Questionnaire, the CSHQ, is thought to be kind of the gold standard for sleep assessments. Um, it was initially created for children ages 4 to 10, um, and now there's a toddler version, ages 2 to 5 and a half. And it basically is a lot of questions, and you get eight subscales on things like bedtime resistance, 
delay of sleep onset, sleep duration, anxiety during sleep, those sorts of things. And we can quantify a lot of the nuances of sleep and sleep patterns based on these questionnaires. Okay, so now let's talk about sleep impairment and autism. As, you, as may not be a surprise to you, sleep problems are really common. I actually, it was funny, I was in clinic yesterday, I saw six patients, five of them were there to see me for sleep impairment. And I actually you know, whipped up a couple of slides for them as we were talking about the biology of it because it's, it's very impairing for families. It's so tiring for parents to be up every two hours with their child, you know? And so it's an issue that we care a lot about and are actively doing, not us particularly, but in the, in the um, general community, um, lots of research is being done on sleep impairment. But anyway, the prevalence rates are reported as high as 80%. And those rates range a little bit based, again, on the population studied and the type of questionnaires being asked. I will highlight this. This is compared to a typically developing population that does not sleep perfectly. So for those of you in the audience with typically developing children, you know, toddlers don't sleep all night all the time. They, they have trouble getting to sleep and wake up in the middle of the night. So, uh, you know, in typically developing kids, sleep impairment has been reported in up to 50% at some level. But still, it's double in autism, right? So, and it's probably more than that. We also actually know that there's some element of sleep impairment that seems specific to ASD. So there's one study, actually a couple of studies that have actually compared sleep impairments in children with autism with IQ matched children who had developmental delays but not autism and have found that the rates are higher in children with autism. And we'll get to that in a second when we talk about etiology. So this is not just an issue of developmental delay. This is actually an impairment that we see specific to autism. So what is the sleep impairment? I keep saying sleep impairment. It's insomnia. What is insomnia? Insomnia is basically not being able to sleep, not getting enough sleep, right? So what is the typical pattern? And I actually, on in that left column, have kind of what the data are from behavioral assessments and then what the data are from the actigraphy and polysomnography studies. And you'll see in both, there's very similar patterns, right? So the first issue is initiation of sleep. It's hard to get the child to go to bed, right? We see that behaviorally, and actually on the actigraphy and PSG studies, there is a prolonged sleep onset time. So it takes longer for a child to get into stage one and stage two sleep, okay? There's also frequent nighttime awakenings, and that is, is actually consistent with what's seen in PSG, which is frequent arousals and sleep fragmentation. So I showed you that graph of that beautiful kind of, we go through these perfect cycles for eight hours, right? Well, in children with autism, that sleep is fragmented. Those cycles get get stopped at some point. And specifically in the sleep studies, I'll just say that there's an increased duration of stage one, which is that lucid kind of, you're not quite fully asleep yet, so it takes longer to get to that place. And then there's also decreased and abnormal stages two to four sleep. So all the non-REM sleep is abnormal. It's not long enough. Some phases are longer. Um, there's not one consistent pattern, but that's sort of the general um, sort of scientific evidence that there are abnormalities in the sleep cycles. So the bottom line is children do not go to bed easily, takes them longer to go to sleep, and then they wake up several times in the middle of the night. And then they wake up early. So the bottom line is they're not getting enough sleep overall, okay? And that's really the sleep pattern that's been described. And this is based on, this is a summary of about 100 studies on sleep and autism. Okay, so what do we know about the comorbidity? And you might say this is just like your slide on epilepsy, and that's true because it's similar issues. So children with autism and sleep impairment do have comorbid behavioral and cognitive disturbances. So uh, there was a really nice paper that was done. Sorry, I don't have the reference down here. I'll pull it up. It was Beth Malo's group, where they kind of looked at kids with autism who are good sleepers and children who are not so good sleepers. And what they found is that children who are good sleepers showed less affective problems like mood regulation. They showed less inattention and hyperactivity, less actually severity of core deficits like repetitive behaviors and better social interaction, right? And so a lot of the research being done now, again, is back to this kind of think about that diagram I showed you with the epilepsy of cause and effect, right? Is it that the underlying biology that's generating the sleep impairment and the autism are one and the same, and that's all linked up in, with more severity of impairment, or is it that not sleeping well influences, right, one's cognitive development and overall behavior? Now, I'm sure everyone in this audience would agree that when you don't sleep well, you are cranky, you don't think well, you don't, you know, we don't function well when we don't sleep. And that's been shown in many, many studies, how important sleep is for cognitive function. So if there's probably um, a, a dynamic process here where both of them are true, right? Where the underlying ideology is causing both, but that then poor sleep begets all these other issues. And that's why treatment of sleep is so important. 
So let's go into etiology for a minute, and then we'll talk about treatment. And I'm doing well with time. Wow. Okay. So. Um, there, there are some clear behavioral etiologies to sleep impairment and autism. It's not all behavioral. Um, and these, this is actually some data that I pulled from a, a colleague of mine in Boston who's a sleep expert. So there are certain behaviors that children on the spectrum have that do impair sleep. So the first is, and these are all sort of behaviors that have been studied, if you will, in, uh, mostly through parent questionnaires. One is that some children may ignore the environmental cues that help entrain the sleep-wake cycle. Right, things like realizing that it's dark outside, it's time to sleep, right? So they ignore those environmental cure cues. Many children on the spectrum also have perseverative thoughts, anxiety, things that actually interfere with the sleep onset. So they become so uh, perseverative about whatever their restricted interest is or whatever their fear or concern is that it actually impairs them being able to settle down enough to go to sleep. In many children, particularly our minimally verbal children, the actual communication impairment can undermine the ability for a parent to actually entrain the child to have a sort of typical sleep pattern, right? They may not understand that at a certain time it's time to sleep because of a, a significant uh, uh, challenge in the communication skills and in the receptive skills and understanding uh, that, you know, this, these sort of verbal cues mean that it's time to go to sleep. And then finally, hypersensitivities might also make it very hard for children to settle down. Right, so those are all kind of the behavioral uh, pieces that we know are important in the etiology of sleep impairment. And this sort of speaks to the reason that we see greater sleep impairment in our group of children with autism compared to children with developmental delay but not autism, right? Because some of these issues are somewhat specific to children with autism, such as the hypersensitivities. But there's also a biology. And again, the, if there's any sleep specialists in the room, I'm sorry, this is like a couple of slides. There's, I know this is, there's a whole science to this, um, which actually we have some people doing beautiful work in the biology of circadian rhythms here at UCLA. Uh, and I enjoy talking with them about these issues. I'm, I'm sort of paring this down to just give you a sense of what we know. But uh, melatonin, really important. So melatonin is a neurohormone, as some of you know, it's secreted by the pineal gland, and the secretions are largely regulated by the hypothalamus, which is really, you know, answering to cues in the environment, right? So melatonin is secreted mostly at night. It's sort of, you know, thought to be like the night hormone, and it, it, it actually provides your body with information that it is time to sleep, right? So melatonin um, secretion patterns, um, and there's metabolites that can be secreted in the urine that can be tested. We see a cyclical secretion pattern of melatonin that relates to the sleep-wake cycles. And it has been shown now in many studies that at least in subgroups of children with autism, there is dysregulation in this, in this secretion, this cyclical secretion of melatonin. This is an example of one really nice study. They looked at nocturnal urinary excretion of a melatonin metabolite. And gray is the population with autism, white is the typically developing control group, and they're age matched. And what they find basically is that at ASD, you have this huge secretion or burst kind of very, very early on, and then it just kind of attenuates. Whereas in typically developing kids, there's sort of a cyclical where it's sort of low, it gets high, it goes back down again, and if this graph kept going, it would go back up again over the course of the, at the next night, right? So the patterns are different. Right now, we don't know which children show this pattern, which would be the next very important step to figure out which children would benefit from a therapy that would regulate melatonin, either synthesis or, or receptors. The other big neurotransmitter I just have to throw out there is GABA, because we know that activation of the particularly GABA-A receptors is critical in regulating and promoting sleep, right? So GABA agonists, things like benzodiazepines, make us sleepy. That's not a coincidence. It's because actually upregulation of GABA does promote sleep. And we all know, and again, I'm oversimplifying a very, very elegant and sophisticated literature on GABA and autism, but we do know that there's GABA dysregulation in at least subsets of children with autism. There's several high-risk genetic variants, like duplications in 15Q, uh, that are associated with upregulation of several GABA-A receptor genes. Right, so we know that GABA-A receptor and GABA actually receptor regulation is very important uh, and possibly pathophysiological in the development of neurodevelopmental disorders and autism, and it's really important for sleep also. So it might be kind of an interesting common pathway in certain syndromes. So I bring these two up because there's treatments that can target these two things, and there's work underway in that. 
So based on the importance and the high prevalence of sleep impairments in autism, um, the sleep committee of the um, uh, of, it was a sleep committee of the Autism Treatment Network that was largely funded by Autism Speaks came up with practice parameters, and those are published in pediatrics. And the bottom line is that they recommended that all children should be screened for insomnia. So how do you screen? It's four really simple questions that were pulled from the CSHQ. Um, one is that they do they fall asleep within 20 minutes. Do they fall asleep in their parents' bed? Um, do they sleep too little? Which I know sounds very subjective, but it's actually a pretty good screener, apparently, based on lots of studies. And do they awaken at least once during the night? So if those screening tests are positive, then the clinician is supposed to do screening for other possible confounders, medical issues like sleep apnea or asthma or allergies. And again, all these details are in the practice parameters in that paper. And then the recommendation is, is to sort of think about therapeutic intervention. And that's where sort of the, the therapy comes in. Here's the key is that behavioral and educational interventions are first line, right? So bedtime routine, calming activities, limiting screen time, limiting the sleep associations and slowly extinguishing those. If, if you know, eating is a sleep association, trying to so, slowly extinguish those finding a proper sleep environment. Now this sounds really easy and I don't mean to sit up here and say that you can just do this. I have children of my own, one of whom was a terrible sleeper for years and this was not gonna work with us, but eventually just grew out of it. Um, but, but it's been studied that educational intervention with parents actually does work and it does improve some aspects of sleep. And I'll just um, provide you with this um, sort of picture of the, um, on, Aut on the Autism Seeks website, they have a whole sleep toolkit that actually goes in excruciating detail about behavioral interventions for sleep impairment. So I definitely would just guide you to that. What about medications? And I'll just say that there's several options. Melatonin has been very well studied actually, and I highlight here the dose, note the dose, two to 10 milligrams. So I have patients that come see me in clinic who are on like 0.025 milligrams of melatonin and are not sleeping, and I always you know, emphasize bump it up, you know, it's a, it's a neurohormone, it's safe, you know, use it, use it the way it's been studied, okay? Now having said that, melatonin is not regulated by the FDA. There are so many formulations of melatonin. And so what I recommend to parents is find a formulation that you like and works and stick to it. Because if you change to a different bottle, it might be actually a very different dosing. And I just quickly will highlight, I love this, so this one company has melatonin three milligrams extra strength, same company, five milligrams, but not extra strength. So, um, so as you can see, these you know formulations are not regulated, and so it's just really important to realize that and stick to one that works. Okay, perfect. I have eight minutes, and I actually really wanted to just spend about five minutes talking about motor, and then we can answer. I can answer some of the clinical questions at the end um, when we do our panel. Okay, so the key points for motor impairment, and I, I put this one in here, not because there's actually that much clinically right now we can do, but it is one of the most common reasons for referral to a neurologist, and it's an area I think of tremendous importance when we think about possibly better quantitative ways to think about some core deficits and developmental domains in autism. So what's nice about motor impairments is that they're overt and measurable, although measurement can be challenging. They are, motor impairments are associated with overall autism severity and intellectual disability. And they may be some of the earliest markers of atypical development in infancy. So to give you a couple of quick definitions, strength is just the force that a muscle can produce with effort, whereas tone is the muscle's resistance to passive stretch during rest. Okay, and those are different. So a child who is low tone, is floppy, is not necessarily weak. And as neurologists, we can, we can actually disentangle those, which is key, because the motor impairment we typically see in autism is actually low tone. It's not weakness. When as neurologists we see weakness, we worry about a primary problem of the muscle or nerve. And it's hard sometimes to disentangle that um, in the office, and that's why it is appropriate if you see a child with significant motor impairment to have a neurological examination. So motor skills are so important for development, right? I just refer you to this one beautiful manuscript by Rafael Campos written in 2000 where he said travel broadens the mind, right? And that can be taken in many different ways, but the idea is that he wrote that the onset of locomotion heralds one of the major life transitions, right? Because it involves a pervasive set of changes in perception, cognition, and social emotional development. Being able to move, being able to point, being able to engage physically absolutely 
uh, augments your ability to socially interact and to communicate. And this has been shown in many, many studies that I won't get into, but motor skills are important, right? The, and that's why in that Venn diagram, I put them in the middle of the kind of core deficits. So in autism, we know repetitive behaviors are a part of the core deficits, but there's many other motor impairments that have been described in the literature. Delays in motor development, which is the only one I'm gonna actually highlight in for about a minute, which is the early motor delays. Hypotonia has been reported in autism, in coordination, gait impairment, praxis, which is the performance of skilled movements, can be impaired in children with autism. And there's a whole literature on each of these bullets. Um, which again, a lot of those references are in your handouts online if you'd like to reference some of those papers. But motor delays can be actually quite informative in the, in the prediction of early developmental delays. And in the infant sibling studies that Dr. Hutman described, there have actually been some groups that have really focused on early motor function, if you will. And I'll just show you one um, slide or figure from one of the large studies of infant siblings. Um, and uh, this is um, Rebecca Landa's group. And what they did was they looked at um, infants who are at low risk and high risk based on having a sibling with autism at three and six months. And they basically looked at the Mullen scales of early learning and the motor domains there. And they looked at, they grouped kids into children who are within normal limits in their performance and children who are low performers. And what they found is the infants at high risk, again, they don't all go on to develop autism, but in the high risk infants, um, more children than not were low performers on their motor scale. Right, and that's true at six months as well. And so, you know, these early motor delays might be important and might be foundational for sort of later developmental trajectories, if you will. Um, and I'm not gonna talk about the gate and praxis, um, but it's here and you have slides. I'm gonna actually talk about this, which is that there's a lot of work really in the last couple of years, literally, um, trying to better quantify motor impairment in autism because you know, we have the gestalt that there are delays, we have the gestalt that there are impairments in, in gait and praxis and other things, but it's hard to actually quantify motor behavior as well as we would like, especially in early development. So there are some standardized measures that can be used, and if there's folks in the group who are occupational therapists and physical therapists at the end, it would be great to hear some thoughts on what measures you like. Um, some of the standardized measures that I'll mention are the Mullen, the Vineland, which is a parent questionnaire but does have subscales for motor function. What's really been exciting in the field in the last year or so is that people are using novel methods to really quantify motor function. And you'll see in the literature over the next five years, I expect many, many more papers that quantify motor function in autism. Um, people have used the Xbox Connect, which is this really, really simple to use device where you can actually map movements in real time and get really exquisite quantitative data on all types of movement variables. And then the Wee Balance Board, I have a postdoc in my lab who's very interested in the relationship between motor function and, and communication in minimally verbal kids. And she just wrote a grant to look at the Wee Balance Board and how balance might be different in children based on their language ability in children with autism because these are areas that we can intervene on in a different sort of way. So quickly, last couple slides in terms of assessments. So I talked about the standardized assessments. The big question that I always get asked in clinic is should we do neuroimaging if a child has motor impairment? And technically, based on practice parameters that were published by the AAN, in a child with global developmental delay, so motor and language and sort of global delays, so that means not just language but also motor, it is recommended that neuroimaging be performed. We in neurology use some clinical judgment with that. If it seems as though it's a very subtle delay and we want to sort of wait to see if they grow out of some of the hypotonia, then we won't actually image. But it is actually recommended that imaging be performed on a child with global developmental delay. And I'll just highlight that there's no one treatment for motor impairment, but in a child with motor delays, physical therapy, occupational therapy might be something that we really emphasize so that we can help bolster the other domains in autism. So my last slide here is that I talked about these you know, core deficits. Um, I'm gonna, this is a term that Dan now has kind of coined it in the review he just wrote. Um, and he talked about kind of the new neurology of autism. And I'm not saying that his whole paper is on this at all, but I love this idea of the new neurology of autism because I actually think that the new neurology of autism is going to be informed by mechanisms and informed by genetics. Because what's perhaps not surprising is that many genetic variants that are associated with autism are related to these comorbidities, right? So epilepsy, we see epilepsy in tuberosclerosis, Rett syndrome, Fragile X, Du15Q syndrome. Sleep impairment is very common, particularly in um, CHD8 mutations, right? 
and then motor impairment, and again, do 15 q Rett syndrome. So when we see these neurological comorbidities, it helps tips us off, tip us off to what might be an underlying genetic etiology, but vice versa, when we diagnose a child early in development with one of these genetic variants, which we're doing more and more, we can much more in an informed way screen for and monitor for these comorbidities. Right? And so I think that this is really where this sort of field of neurology of autism is moving. And I will stop by just giving you a quick sort of um, glimpse into a new clinic that we've started through our autism center and through our um, child and adult neurodevelopmental clinic. It's called the um, Developmental Neurogenetics Clinic. And this is an opportunity for children who have the need to see a neurologist where there also is a known genetic variant or syndrome. So if a child has a neurodevelopmental disorder and a known genetic variant, they actually can come into our clinic and they're seen by neurology, psychiatry, and genetics. And the reason we built this clinic is really in, in line with that last slide I showed you, that the genetics of autism has informed our understanding of these comorbidities, and they're very, very, very much related to each other. And so we'd like to sort of see these rare disorders in a systematic way to help provide consultation, but then ultimately to actually uh, steer that into meaningful clinical trials. And that's where I will end. Thank you for your time. Right on time. Okay.